In this video, we're going to take a look at hemoglobin. To recap from the video on protein structure, hemoglobin was the fourth form, the quaternary form of protein structure. In this video will first look at receptor ligand interactions. We'll then cover the general structure of hemoglobin. And finally, we'll apply the dynamics of receptor ligand interactions to hemoglobin. So, let's begin by looking at the basics of receptor ligand interactions. Let's look at the definition of affinity. Affinity represents the strength of a single bond. In general, this is between a receptor and a ligand. And later on, our receptor will be hemoglobin, and the ligand will be many other molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. The general equation for quantifying affinity is similar to the equilibrium constant reaction from chemistry. Take a look at the following reaction where the receptor ligand complex gets split up into a free receptor and a free ligand. So RL becomes R and L. The equilibrium constant for this reaction, also known as the dissociation constant or KD, is the concentration of the free receptor times the concentration of the free ligand divided by the combination concentration of receptor and ligand. An important thing to know about the value for KD is that KD will be smaller for a stronger bond. A stronger affinity means a stronger bond, which means there will be more receptor ligand bound together, more of the receptor ligand bound together, and less individual R and L. This means the value for KD will be smaller for a stronger bond because as R and L decrease and RL increases, the overall constant decreases, so KD eventually goes down. A smaller KD means a stronger bond and a tighter bond a larger KD means a weaker bond. Okay, so we now know how to quantify the interaction between one specific site. But what if there's more than one site? Take, for instance, hemoglobin and antibodies. Hemoglobin has four binding sites, while antibodies have two binding sites. In the case of antibodies, the two binding sites are independent of each other. What this means is the combined KD of simultaneous binding sites is found by squaring or by multiplying the KD for each binding site. So in this example here, the KD for one site is one millimolar, and the KD for the second site is also one millimolar, and together the KD for the combined antibody is one micromolar. Notice how that lowers the value of the KD, and a smaller value of KD means a tighter bond, so the antibody can bind to the antigen stronger. In the case of hemoglobin, the sites are not independent, and they exhibit what's known as cooperative binding. We'll take a look later on in this video of the details of cooperative binding. To understand this better, let's first define an important concept known as fractional occupancy. Fractional occupancy for a univalent receptor is defined as L over KD plus L. Univalent means that the receptor binds only one molecule of ligand. Over here, L represents the ligand free ligand concentration, and KD is the dissociation constant, and theta is the fractional occupancy. When theta is equal to 1, all the receptors are occupied by ligands. When it's lower than 1, there are free receptors available. This equation becomes useful for hemoglobin that has multiple binding sites due to the Hill equation that's a variation of the fractional occupancy term. The Hill equation uses the term N that represents the degree of cooperativity within the molecule. The more the value of N, the more the cooperativity. Before we begin to use these concepts to understand hemoglobin's binding dynamics, let's take a look at the structure of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin consists of two alpha and two beta chains. It's made up of four polypeptide units. The heme is a prosthetic group consisting of a porphyrin ring that is associated with an iron atom responsible for binding oxygen. If we look closely into this figure, this structure here is the porphyrin ring, and as you can see, there's an iron atom in the middle that will eventually bind the oxygen. All right, so let's now combine what we've learned. For myoglobin, the saturation versus oxygen pressure graph is a hyperbolic curve, and the reason for this is that it has only one binding site. Notice that its value n is equal to 1, and this n is the same n from the Hill equation. For hemoglobin, due to the cooperativity between the different binding sites, the curve is a sigmoidal shaped curve due to an increase in cooperativity as represented by the 2.8 value here. Because of the cooperativity within the hemoglobin molecule, 
the binding sites are not independent, and so they can transfer almost twice as much oxygen as myoglobin. So now we're going to look at the effects of certain molecules on hemoglobin. Let's look at the effect of pH and carbon dioxide. To study this better, look at the following reaction that involves carbon dioxide and water to form carbonic acid before that splits up into the carbonate ion and H+. So a buildup of carbon dioxide leads to a buildup of hydrogen ions and a decrease in the pH. When you exercise, there's a drop in pH in your muscles. To take care of that, oxygen is needed to oxidize the acids that are formed and to re restore the pH in the muscles. To do this, hemoglobin needs to release the oxygen and that's why when you exercise, there's a drop in pH in the muscles and a subsequent shift in the hemoglobin curve to the right and downwards. So as you can see here, as it moves to the right and downwards, the saturation of hemoglobin is lower and that means more oxygen has been released. Another important molecule in blood is BPG that acts to lower hemoglobin's oxygen affinity. This image here shows you that in a hemoglobin molecule, that's where the BPG lies. It allosterically binds in the center of free hemoglobin due to its negative charge. So you can see here the negative charges interact with the positive charges on the heme groups, and that prevents oxygen from binding. In fact, it's the affinity for BPG that differentiates maternal and fetal hemoglobin. Since fetal hemoglobin binds less strongly to BPG, its hemoglobin curve is shifted to the left compared to maternal hemoglobin curve. That's what this graph here shows you. With BPG, the saturation curve is much more shifted to the right compared to no BPG. So fetal hemoglobin is more like this curve, while this is how adult hemoglobin is. Essentially, the effect of BPG is that it shifts the hemoglobin curve to the right, causing more oxygen to be released. So let's just recap what we've seen so far. This graph here just does that. Um, the effects of carbon dioxide and the increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, or BPG or DPG, is to shift the curve towards the right, and no BPG shifts it extremely towards the left, and this just shows you where fetal hemoglobin lies and where maternal hemoglobin lies. So notice how the fetal hemoglobin accepts more oxygen easily compared to the maternal hemoglobin that releases the oxygen more easily. What really distinguishes hemoglobin from myoglobin is its cooperativity, and now we're going to look at models for this. There are two main models, the sequential model and the considered model. In both these models, there are T states and R states. The T state is the tense state without oxygen, and the R state is the relaxed state or with oxygen. In the sequential model, the units change one at a time. So the binding of one unit changes the affinity of another unit. In the considered model that we'll just see in a minute, all the units change together, whereas over here they're changing one after another. So the affinity increases as more oxygen binds. In the concerted model, which is like a one-step model, there are essentially two states, predominantly a low affinity state or a predominantly high affinity state. There's no TR combination as in the sequential model. So if there's only one oxygen bound, it'll readily favor the T state because there's very little oxygen. If there's more than two oxygens bound, it'll readily favor the R state or the relaxed state. When there's only two oxygens, it could be in either state, the T state or the R state. So which model should we choose to describe the behavior of hemoglobin? Well, neither model is adequate, and the real system actually has elements of both models. I'm not going to read this part, but you can pause the video and take a look at this, or visit this website for more information on which model is more accurate. So just to recap some of the concepts that we covered in this video, we looked at binding reactions and the dynamics of binding. We looked at fractional occupancy and how you obtain the fractional occupancy curves for myoglobin and hemoglobin. We then looked at the structure of hemoglobin and how different molecules affect its binding. And finally, we looked at two possible models to describe hemoglobin while also realizing the limitations of each.